episode 677. Book talk begins at 14 minutes and 54 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 677, The Penultimate. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and our channel members on YouTube and our new membership audio members over at craftlet.com slash premium. This week, we would like to highlight Jean Greaves, who you're going to hear from again shortly, Karen LePage, Robert, Sydney Jean Hutchinson, and Anne Blanton creator of the fabulous Halloween quilt that I will be choosing a winner for the raffle of. (laughs) How is that for grammatically interesting? That is getting chosen three days after this episode airs. So if you haven't been listening in real time, at least to the opening bits, it is your own fault if you miss out on this quilt. It is so beautiful. Along with our raffle for the fabulous Halloween quilt, we have several other things that are happening this month. We have our Haunting of Hill House book party with special guest host Tara Worster, who you have heard before on the podcast. Uh, She and I were just talking last night about this book, and I am so jazzed about Shirley Jackson. I knew the lottery, and that's basically it. But I did find a lovely little documentary that shows her son, her youngest son of four, who still lives in Bennington, Vermont, or at least did when this video was made, which didn't seem to be too much too long ago. But you get to see that Shirley Jackson's house, and he gets a tour of it from the current owners and gets to tell you, you know, which rooms she wrote in. And I guess she got all of her bad juju out on the page because it sounded like she was just lovely. And I would never have Imagine that. I mean, you have poor Lucy Maud Montgomery, who writes Anne of Green Gables, and we find out like, oh, and her her home life was not very happy. And then Shirley Jackson, I'm thrilled. And I'm just, I'm trying to sponge in everything I can about Shirley Jackson right now. So if you have any Shirley Jackson info that you want to share, you can always call 206-350-1642. You can write to heather at craftlet.com, or you can Uh, pay up for the month and come and join us at the book party on October 24th. I would look forward to seeing you there. It'll be hosted on our Discord server. So if you are planning on joining and you haven't been part of the Discord server before, please make sure that you let us know one way or another that you have paid up and that you want to be there with us because we would love to have you. It will be a lot of fun. I also, let's see, last week I uploaded Frankenstein last weekend. This weekend, I started uploading Dracula to YouTube, and then I got locked out of my Libsyn account, and I don't know what happened. I had to reboot my computer several times. I'm not sure what was going on. I'm hoping that after I record today, and I go back upstairs, and I check, that I'm going to be able to get in to Libsyn, because I can't do the YouTube posting without that. But I was very excited. And there's, oh my gosh, there is one guy who comments on everything who leaves the most lovely, like poetic comments. They're not, they're not haikus. They're just like poetry. So hi. <laughs> I, I, you know, I never know if people's names on their YouTube handles are their real names. So I don't know if I should name you or not, but thank you. It really has just made, made my day on many days. And I am so glad that you've been enjoying listening to Frankenstein and Dracula. Dracula is a special one. Dracula was the first time we worked with John Scholes. And if you haven't listened to Dracula before, the craftlet version, oh, please do. For one thing, perfect for the season. But for another thing, 
the the cast of readers really brought that book to life in a way that I didn't expect. And I had access to some really good research on Bram Stoker and on Dracula when when we started that book. And so I'm, it's, mm, I love it. I love it. I've been having fun going back and actually listening to myself, which I never, ever, 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 ever want to do. But I did. And I'm entertained. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly I'm like, oh, I now I remember that. I'd forgotten all about that. Now I know. Okay. So if you've listened recently, I still have people. What is it? 10? No, it's more than that now. 15 years later, I have still met people online or in Zoom meetings or sometimes in person. And I have still had them say things like, you sound so much better. I'm like, you just listened to Frankenstein, didn't you? Because I had pneumonia when I was recording it. And I say, I, there are episodes where you can hear me just going. So forewarned is forearmed. You will you will hear me struggling to breathe. It was a very eventful book uh, recording time in my life. I was not expecting that, but but the book is great. The other little newsy bit of news for you is that my father and I, Dr. Charles Frederick Hutchinson, he and I recorded the first episode of Why Don't They Just which is the new podcast, or actually it's a vodcast. I'm not going to host it as an audio feed. I'm only going to put it up on YouTube because I can do that for free, honestly. And because, you know, like with Craftlet, part of my mission is with things like Frankenstein and Dracula. People think they know the book because they saw a movie or they read a comic book or a graphic novel version. All of which is legit and all of which I have loved myself. But they therefore think that they know the book. And part of my goal with Craftlet is to make sure that not only do you understand the differences between the, the books and the, the other uh, media that you can consume the story on, but also so that you start to understand the book well enough that you can see why people made the decisions that they did when they adapted it into a movie or a TV show or something. And I am going to do a review on the new Three Musketeers movie part two. I have watched it. I need to watch it again. They made many changes. So the first half, the D'Artagnan half of this, the French Three Musketeers, very on point. What they changed, I loved. Eva Green's costumes, I'm just warning you in advance, if you watch Bernadette Banner, you're going to blow a gasket. So just be aware. I felt so bad for her. I don't know what they were thinking. But at the same time, she gets to do a fight that is at least as good as, if not better than, the Zorro fight between Antonio Banderas and Catherine Cedar jones And Zorro's good. If you haven't watched Zorro, that Zorro, the Antonio, Bander the Antonio Banderas Zorro, please do. Kids loved it. I showed it to them. Like, how, how did we not see this movie before? I, I honestly don't know because I love it. I don't know what I was thinking. It's a great movie. It's very fun and goofy. And uh, Antonio... Mi amor. He's just lovely. So is Catherine Zeta Jones, though. I mean, when you have two people that are that attractive and also that skilled on screen together, it's just a lot of fun to watch. But as I was saying, my dad and I recorded the first episode of Why Don't They Just? And the whole idea behind that is like Craftlet. There are things we think we know because it's either something that we think is common sense or conventional wisdom. And in, in both cases, the sense is not common and the wisdom is not wisdom at all, much less conventional. And these are things that often you really have to talk to an expert in the field, in somebody who understands their field well enough that they can sit there and see where you're getting confused. I used to do this when I was teaching English. I loved the days that we would be talking about a difficult text like the Scarlet Letter. And some kid would make a comment that was not factually true did not match what we were reading in the book, but I could see why they came up with that answer. And those were great days because the confused look on a kid's face when you go, no, wrong, but great answer. And here's why. And then, you know, eventually somebody through the, the course of the discussion, somebody goes, oh, I get it. Okay, well, this. The ask, asking the wrong question is more often part of the problem than getting the wrong answer. And so part of this episode is dad and me kind of setting up the paradigm for the discussions that I'm going to be having on this show with other scientists and experts in their field where everybody who everybody who knits at some point somebody is going to watch you knitting and say why don't you just knit 
continental? Or why don't you just knit British? Or why don't you just knit Irish cottage production knitting, you know, lever knitting? Somebody's always going to have a question like that. You have answers. You have pretty good answers for why you're doing what you're doing. People don't do things on accident like this most of the time, habitual things on accident most of the time. And we tend not to believe things on accident either. So I want this set up to be both we do the talking and I ask the questions and I do a lot of listening. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments and I'm I'm asking people and I'm putting it on screen. I'm asking people if they have a follow-up question to write question in all caps and then write their question. That way I can find the questions in the midst of all the comments much more easily. But then I can have whoever my guest is today, this the one that we recorded yesterday is my dad, we can bring back that expert and pose these follow-up questions for them to, to answer. Plus, the other thing that I'm really looking forward to about this is science is always growing. It's, it's a growth industry. There's always more new discoveries being made in all sorts of sciences. We don't do a very good job teaching that in school, and we definitely don't do a good job teaching that out in the world in larger legacy media. So as there are innovations and new data coming in on the topics that we discuss, I am also going to, at that point, bring those guests back in and let them explain this new stuff and how this new piece of information is changing the paradigm. I'm very excited about it. I've been trying to get my dad to do this with me since Christmas last year. And he kept saying, yeah, 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 no, that's a great idea. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. You will laugh when you watch this episode. You will laugh at what it was that finally tipped his hand and got him talking to me. It is not what you think it is, but it was fun. We had a really good time and I, I hope you enjoy it too. And I've got two more people I'm talking to soon lined up. As soon as I get three episodes, I will release them all every other day for a week. And then and then I'll have a new schedule set up for, for releasing them. But I'm, oh, I'm very excited. I will also, uh, with the next episode, be able to announce next books for both the book party and the watch party. I want to do more of the pairings, like two of the ones right off the top of my head that I've been uh, thinking about that I'm I'm thinking pretty seriously about is the book Rebecca and the movie Rebecca, both awesome. And then I was thinking The Thin Man, the book The Thin Man and the first movie of The Thin Man. Because Myrna Loy and William Powell are just, uh, I know I've talked, I've talked about this recently because I talked about Myrna Loy wrinkling her nose. And I can't believe I didn't think about pairing those two before. So we'll have a book party uh, one month when we read the book. And then the next month we will do the watch party again over on Discord. And all that information will be in our newsletter, which we are getting much better at getting out. So at the end of every month, beginning of a new month, we will have newsletter information for what's coming next. And that will uh, help you know how to plan. If you do hoard, uh, because we are able to do so much more now, uh, now that I have Eric and Michelle and Valkyrie, and and I'm my brain is still not 100%, but my body is much better. We will be doing uh, more future thinking and planning so that we can get more of the good stuff to you because there is so much. And right now I feel like we need a lot of good stuff beamed at us. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to uh, dig some of that up and provide it to you. This week, I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to have something uh, from Jean Graves to share with you. And that is that I got a text message from her. Over the weekend, she was at the DAR Museum down in D.C., and she sent me a picture, and she said she was at the textiles exhibit, and she recognized, without having to look at the tag, a housewife, the little husif, the housewife, the rolled up sewing kit from, uh, I think it's, was it Revolutionary War? I'm looking at the other things in the cabinet. I think it's Revolutionary War. Well, if it's not Revolutionary War, it's a Civil War. Oh no, that thread winder might be World War One. Anyway, it's really cool. And Jean had that moment of, oh my gosh, I learned it on Craftlit, uh -huh. which always makes me happy. But I do have a link from her to details on the exhibit. It's going to be there for a while. So if you are anywhere near Washington, D.C., she said, 
great exhibit. Please try and go. And if you aren't anywhere near Washington, D.C., you can follow the link and see some of the details about it. And that's that's always a nice thing, too. Okay, this week, our chapter, we're only going to do one chapter. And it's the penultimate. Last week, we talked about ultimate and penultimate. And this week, it is the penultimate episode. Next episode, 678, will be the final episode of Emma. And then we'll have a two-week break. And then we'll do the live stream. So you'll have a chance to catch up listening, send in comments, questions, reviews, you know, just your thoughts thoughts about Emma. And that also includes adaptations of Emma. So if you really don't have anything important or that you feel is important to say about the book, but you do have something that you want to share about one of the movie adaptations or television adaptations, again, please do. And we will share any audio or written questions that we get uh, during the live stream. Again, it'll be on the Sunday. I think it's the second Sunday in November so that we do it before Thanksgiving in the United States and That'll keep everything safe and calm. So our chapter this week is uh, Volume 3, Chapter 16, or Chapter 52, if you are going linearly through the book. And it is tonally different from the previous chapter and tonally different from the last chapters. Uh, There are several that we will do for the end of the book. And that's one of the reasons why this is kind of a standalone. At the end, I I certainly felt like, oh, maybe I should go on and do the next chapter because you kind of have a running start at it. But then I I did go back and, and listen again to the chapter that follows this. And we need to sit with what we learn in this chapter for a little while and appreciate it. So it's, I think it's fine. The, and there's not, you know, as we get closer and closer to the end of the book, there's less complex information that's being funneled at us. One of them is um, you're going to hear about going to see a dentist there was dentistry at this time. It was not necessarily a pleasant procedure. And finding a reputable dentist who would actually help was tricky. They did have some medication, some ways to kind of ease the pain or knock you out a little bit, but not much. And so it's kind of scary. As a consequence, Emma's solution makes a lot of sense. And remember last week I said Emma, Jane Austen had to come up with kind of a clever way to get Harriet out of the way. It no longer feels quite so contrived. I mean, I suppose it still is, but it feels less contrived because reasons. And and that's fine. It was clever enough and also appropriate to the time. Something Something that people would have done by leaving their village and going into the big city to to deal with it. So I know we've heard about and seen and probably made uh, reticules, the R-E-T-I-C-U-L-E, the little handbags from the Regency era where they were, you know, they were small. They were kind of, uh, sometimes they were eggplant shaped. They were kind of all over the place. You could do a whole lot of different things with them. And they lasted for a long time as a useful adornment. So they were both pretty, but also useful because the lines of the Regency era dresses, those ampere waist dresses, didn't really work with the way people had been doing pockets prior to this. They had the split skirt, split side skirts, and then they could tie pockets, you know, giant pockets underneath their skirt and access them through the slits on the side, which is genius. And there are lots of videos on the YouTuber if you want to go find all sorts of really cool details and examples of people making those both back then and now. But that wasn't going to work very well with the on pure waist dress. For one thing, it would totally mess up your silhouette. So duh. But also, it would be really hard to place those pockets appropriately and not cause yourself some trouble uh, if you were just like placing a slit in the middle of the side of your dress and then expecting to be able to reach in and use the pockets. That would be a little awkward. So. We've heard about reticules before. I had never seen it written ridicule, R-I-D-I-C-U-L-E, like ridiculous. I have tried to find out if this was just what happens sometimes with spelling. It, it looks like it's an alternative spelling, but I don't. I can't find any information on why it's an alternative spelling. I don't know if this is Jane Austen doing some subtle dig at a character or not. I'm not sure. If you know, please let the rest of us know. 206-350-1642. Uh, this, this chapter, we're going to get some classically horrifying Mrs. Elton. And we're also going to get some really kind of adorably flustered 
Miss Bates. But for, first we get the Elton. We have to suffer through the Elton first. She is going to quote a rhyming couplet from a fable at you from John Gay. The fable is The Hair and Many Friends. It was first published in 1727. There was a fable like this when I was growing up. Was it Henny Penny? Who was it? The sky was falling and, and everybody's like, oh, I'll help, I'll help, I'll help. And then nobody's there to help when things really do kind of come down to the wire. This is that same idea. This is a, a hare, a bunny rabbit, a female bunny rabbit. Her care was never to offend, and every creature was her friend. So she thought she had all these friends, but then when push came to shove, and there was some pushing and some shoving, her friends were like, yee, okay, bye. And she was surprised. This is Jane Austen cleverly inserting, like, if you've missed the theme, if you've missed one of the themes of this book about real friendship versus kind of posturing friendships, here's a reminder because people would have known this, this fable that's being referred to. It is also interesting that Mrs. Elton doesn't remember the name of the fable, doesn't remember where she's heard it, and only remembers kind of an awkward rhyming couplet. When you hear it, you may want to back up and listen to it again, just to put it in its place in her head. So there's that. And then right after that, there's uh, the phrase, a word to the wise. Okay. I know on the podcast, we have talked about how I went through most of my life, and I think most of the English-speaking world has gone through their life thinking that the proof is in the pudding is a complete statement. <laughs> At least in the United States, we have thought that was the whole statement. It's actually the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. You can't tell how good a pudding is until you taste it. You can't know if you're going to like something or not until you try it. Here's another one that I did not know had a second half, and that is a word to the wise is sufficient. So it's not just, hey, heads up, a word to the wise, and then you go on and explain something at great length. It's supposed to be a word to the wise is sufficient. A wise person, all you need to do is say trouble, and they go, oh, roger that. Okay, got it. It's very different. And apparently that goes back as far as uh, Plautus in mm, somewhere between 254 and 184 BCE. And he was uh, one of the comedic uh, playwrights in uh, Roman times. So it goes, it goes back at least that far. But I think there's a lot of cultures and a lot of places that have some variation on a word to the wise is sufficient. I love learning stuff like that. You know I do. Okay, so... Miss Bates, when Miss Bates comes in midway through the chapter, she will be flustered. And this is like rhyme, Miss Bates. The, just everything about her coming in at this point in the story, in this point in the chapter, and talking is so Miss Bates. But we're going to flash the, uh, briefly put the, the video version. We're going to show the text that I'm about to talk about uh, after we do the book we'll put it up for longer. And if you are listening to the audio only, I don't think you'll have a hard time visualizing this. Uh, usually when Miss Bates is speaking, there's either dot, dot, dot ellipses or there are M dashes. <laughs> this is a brick of M dashes. I've listened to several different recordings of this chapter and especially this part. And it's just hard to read. So when you hear Miss Bates come in and you hear how flustered she is, you are going to hear her be like a rat in a maze. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I mean, like going down one direction, going, oh, darn, I'm not supposed to say that. And then going another direction. Oh, darn, I'm not supposed to say that. And she keeps having to realign herself because she's not sure what she should be allowed to say at this point. And it's it's really adorable, especially after Mrs. Elton has spent so much of the time today being a total prig and really, really miserable. So yeah, we get we get a little charming Batesness, which she just gets charming sometimes. I know she can drive everybody crazy. She can drive me crazy too. But this is one of those times when I have great empathy for her because I can totally see getting yourself in a situation like you're, oh, shoot, what am I allowed to say now? Secrets. I wrote a lot of rolling eyes and tongue sticking out faces next to everything that Mrs. Elton says in this particular chapter. So buckle in. But the other thing 
uh, that she refers to, and she does it in passing. And I know we've talked about it before, but I don't think it really dawned on me as a person who grew up in the United States just how complete and complex the intertwining of the church and state were, uh, certainly at this time. But we see it even in like in the women in white, birth records, marriage records, all those records were kept at the parish. And going back in history, you need to go to the, the church, the local church, the parish, to find ye oldie book records and birth records and death records and all of that stuff, marriage records. That means that you have the church official for that local area also for a large part being involved in the the local i don't want to say ma- politics but the local management of the place so magistrates overseers church wardens all of these people would be working together so when we have an inquest that happens these are the people who get called in if you watch the new poldark the new smoldery poldark uh that came out a few years ago there was a lot of magistrate talk going on at various points in the story. And yeah, uh, I don't remember the clergy being as visibly involved in Poldark, but Mrs. Elton is not just blowing smoke up your shorts here. She's She is actually correct, although just appalling. You'll also hear Mrs. Elton talk about her crayons, her paper and crayons. She is not talking about, you know, a box of 28 multicolored wax crayons that were made in Pennsylvania. She is, in fact, talking about things like charcoals and pastels and Conti crayons and things like that, which are, you know, something that you would expect someone who'd actually been trained in sketching an art at this time period to know how to use and to use. I know we've come across it before, but for the Americans out there, receipt is the same as recipe. So just don't stumble on that one. And the very end of our chapter today, they're going to talk about a period of mourning. Now, we've we've already had so many instances in this book where uh, the amount of time spent doing something is actually code. We've talked a lot about like the 14 minutes versus 15 minutes of visiting time, things like that. There is no code in this one. The mourning period that is uh, mentioned is perfectly acceptable, absolutely appropriate. Nobody is slighting anybody else. Nobody is... Uh, quietly insulting anybody else. It's fine. It's just fine. I also have found that I have a really hard time at the very end, right after we talk about the period of mourning, being able to tell who's talking. And it's because most of what's being said could come from either person's mouth, which is kind of lovely when you get there. But I will tell you right now, as far as the text goes, if you count by like where the parenthesis punctuation marks end and begin for quotationalizing this stuff, it is definitely Emma who has the last uh, several sentences at the end of today's chapter. But you can also tell, again, from the way the sentences are, are written, that the person she's talking to is basically saying exactly the same thing to her at the same time. Kind of like when you meet two people meet after a long time and you both say at the same time, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. And you've both just talked over each other and you start laughing. That's this. That's what's happening today, which is lovely. All right. I'm going to let you listen to chapter, well, volume three, chapter 16 for the people who are reading that kind of book. And chapter 52, if you are reading to a linear count of the chapters, If you are listening to your own version of Emma, please fast wind to 47 minutes and 42 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 3, Chapter 16 It was a very great relief to Emma to find Harriet as desirous as herself to avoid a meeting. Their intercourse was painful enough by letter. How much worse had they been obliged to meet— Harriet expressed herself very much as might be supposed, without reproaches or apparent sense of ill-usage, and yet Emma fancied there was a something of resentment, a something bordering on it in her style, which increased the desirableness of their being separate. It might be only her own consciousness, but it seemed as if an angel only could have been quite without resentment under such a stroke. She had no difficulty in procuring Isabella's invitation— and she was fortunate in having a sufficient reason for asking it, without resorting to invention. There was a tooth amiss. Harriet really wished, and had wished some time, to consult a dentist. 
Mrs. John Knightley was delighted to be of use. Anything of ill health was a recommendation to her, and though not so fond of a dentist as of a Mr. Wingfield, she was quite eager to have Harriet under her care. When it was thus settled on her sister's side, Emma proposed it to her friend and found her very persuadable. Harriet was to go, she was invited for at least a fortnight, she was to be conveyed in Mr. Woodhouse's carriage, it was all arranged, it was all completed, and Harriet was safe in Brunswick Square. Now Emma could, indeed, enjoy Mr. Knightley's visits, now she could talk and she could listen with true happiness, unchecked by that sense of injustice, of guilt, of something most painful, which had haunted her when remembering how disappointed a heart was near her, how much might at that moment, and at a little distance, be enduring by the feelings which she had led astray herself. The difference of Harriet at Mrs. Goddard's, or in London, made perhaps an unreasonable difference in Emma's sensations but she could not think of her in London without objects of curiosity and employment which must be averting the past, and carrying her out of herself. She would not allow any other anxiety to succeed directly to the place in her mind which Harriet had occupied. There was a communication before her, one which she only could be competent to make, the confession of her engagement to her father. But she would have nothing to do with it at present. She had resolved to defer the disclosure till Mrs. Weston were safe and well. No additional agitation should be thrown at this period among those she loved, and the evil should not act on herself by anticipation before the appointed time. A fortnight at least of leisure and peace of mind, to crown every warmer but more agitating delight, should be hers. She soon resolved, equally as a duty and a pleasure, to employ half an hour of this holiday of spirits in calling on Miss Fairfax. She ought to go, and she was longing to see her, the resemblance of their present situations increasing every other motive of good will. It would be a secret satisfaction, but the consciousness of a similarity of prospect would certainly add to the interest with which she should attend to anything Jane might communicate. She went. She had driven once successfully to the door, but had not been into the house since the morning after Box Hill, when poor Jane had been in such distress as had filled her with compassion, though all the worst of her sufferings had been unsuspected. The fear of being still unwelcome determined her, though assured of their being at home, to wait in the passage and send up her name. She heard Patty announcing it, but no such bustle succeeded as poor Miss Bates had before made so happily intelligible. No. She heard nothing but the instant reply of, "'Beg her to walk up,' and a moment afterwards she was met on the stairs by Jane herself, coming eagerly forward, as if no other reception of her were felt sufficient. Emma had never seen her look so well, so lovely, so engaging. There was consciousness, animation, and warmth. There was everything which her countenance or manner could ever have wanted. She came forward with an offered hand, and said in a low but very feeling tone, "'This is most kind, indeed.' "'Miss Woodhouse, it is impossible for me to express—I hope you will believe—excuse me for being so entirely without words.' Emma was gratified, and would soon have shown no want of words, if the sound of Mrs. Elton's voice from the sitting-room had not checked her, and made it expedient to compress all her friendly and all her congratulatory sensations into a very, very earnest shake of the hand. Mrs. Bates and Mrs. Elton were together. Miss Bates was out, which accounted for the previous tranquillity. Emma could have wished Mrs. Elton elsewhere, but she was in a humour to have patience with everybody, and as Mrs. Elton met her with unusual graciousness, she hoped the rencontre would do them no harm. She soon believed herself to penetrate Mrs. Elton's thoughts, and understand why she was, like herself, in happy spirits. It was being in Miss Fairfax's confidence, and fancying herself acquainted with what was still a secret to other people. Emma saw symptoms of it immediately in the expression of her face, and while paying her own compliments to Mrs. Bates, and appearing to attend to the good old lady's replies, she saw her with a sort of anxious parade of mystery fold up a letter which she had apparently been reading aloud to Miss Fairfax, and return it into the purple and gold reticule by her side, saying, with significant nods, "'We can finish this some other time, you know. You and I shall not want opportunities. And, in fact, you have heard all the essential already.' I only wanted to prove to you that Mrs. S. admits our apology, and is not offended. You see how delightfully she writes. Oh, she is a sweet creature. You would have doted on her had you gone. But not a word more. Let us be discreet. Quite on our good behaviour. Hush! You remember those lines. I forget the poem at this moment. For when a lady's in the case, you know all other things give place. 
Now I say, my dear, in our case, for Lady Reed— Ma'am, a word to the wise. I am in a fine flow of spirits, aren't I? But I want to set your heart at ease as to Mrs. S. My representation, you see, has quite appeased her. And again, on Emma's merely turning her head to look at Mrs. Bates's knitting, she added in half a whisper, I mention no names, you will observe. Oh, no, cautious as a minister of state, I managed it extremely well. Emma could not doubt. It was a palpable display, repeated on every possible occasion. When they had all talked a little while in harmony of the weather and Mrs. Weston, she found herself abruptly addressed with, "'Do not you think, Miss Woodhouse, our saucy little friend here is charmingly recovered? Do not you think her cure does parry the highest credit?' Here was a side-glance of great meaning at Jane. Upon my word, Perry has restored her in a wonderful short time. Oh, if you had seen her as I did when she was at the worst! And when Mrs. Bates was saying something to Emma, whispered further, We do not say a word of any assistance that Perry might have, not a word of a certain young physician from Windsor. Oh, no, Perry shall have all the credit. I have scarce had the pleasure of seeing you, Miss Woodhouse she shortly afterwards began, since the party to Box Hill, very pleasant party, but yet I think there was something wanting. Things did not seem—that is, there seemed a little cloud upon the spirits of some. So it appeared to me, at least, but I might be mistaken. However, I think it answered so far as to tempt one to go again. What say you both to our collecting the same party, and exploring to Box Hill again, while the fine weather lasts? It must be the same party, you know, quite the same party, not one exception." Soon after this Miss Bates came in, and Emma could not help being diverted by the perplexity of her first answer to herself, resulting, she supposed, from doubt of what might be said, and impatience to say everything. "'Thank you, dear Miss Woodhouse, you are all kindness. It is impossible to say. Yes, indeed, I quite understand. Dearest Jane's prospects—that is, I do not mean. But she is charmingly recovered. How is Mr. Woodhouse? I am so glad. Quite out of my power. Such a happy little circle as you find us here. Yes, indeed, charming young man. That is, so very friendly. I mean good Mr. Perry. Such attention to Jane." and from her great, her more than commonly thankful delight towards Mrs. Elton for being there, Emma guessed that there had been a little show of resentment towards Jane from the vicarage quarter, which was now graciously overcome. After a few whispers, indeed, which placed it beyond a guess, Mrs. Elton, speaking louder, said, "'Yes, here I am, my good friend, and here I have been so long that anywhere else I should think it necessary to apologise. But the truth is that I am waiting for my lord and master. He promised to join me here, and pay his respects to you.' "'What? Are we to have the pleasure of a call for Mr. Elton? That'll be a favour indeed, for I know gentlemen do not like morning visits, and Mr. Elton's time is so engaged.' "'Upon my word, it is, Miss Bates. He really is engaged from morning to night. There is no end of people's coming to him on some pretence or other. The magistrates and overseers and church wardens are always wanting his opinion. They seem not able to do anything without him. Upon my word, Mr. E., I often say, rather you than I. I do not know what would become of my crayons and my instrument if I had half so many applicants. Bad enough as it is, for I absolutely neglect them both to an unpardonable degree. I believe I have not played a bar this fortnight. However, he is coming, I assure you. Yes, indeed, on purpose to wait on you all. And putting up her hand to screen her words from Emma. A congratulatory visit, you know. Oh, yes, quite indispensable. Miss Bates looked about her, so happily. He promised to come to me as soon as he could disengage himself from Knightley, but he and Knightley are shut up together in deep consultation. Mr. E. is Knightley's right hand. Emma would not have smiled for the world, and only said, Is Mr. Elton gone on foot to Donwell? He will have a hot walk. No, no, it is a meeting at the Crown, a regular meeting. Weston and Cole will be there, too, but one is apt to speak only of those who lead. I fancy Mr. E. and Knightley have everything their own way. "'Have not you mistaken the day?' said Emma. "'I am almost certain that the meeting at the Crown is not till to-morrow. Mr. Knightley was at Hartfield yesterday, and spoke of it as for Saturday.' 
"'Oh, no, the meeting is certainly today." was the abrupt answer, which denoted the impossibility of any blunder on Mrs. Elton's side. "'I do believe,' she continued, "'this is the most troublesome parish that ever was. We never heard of such things at Maple Grove.' "'Your parish there was small,' said Jane. "'Upon my word, my dear, I do not know, for I never heard the subject talked of.' "'But it is proved by the smallness of the school, which I have heard you speak of, as under the patronage of your sister and Mrs. Bragg, the only school, and not more than five-and-twenty children. "'Ah, you clever creature, that's very true. What a thinking brain you have! I say, Jane, what a perfect character you and I should make if we could be shaken together. My liveliness and your solidity would produce perfection.' Not that I presume to insinuate, however, that some people may not think you perfection already. But hush, not a word, if you please. It seemed an unnecessary caution. Jane was wanting to give her words not to Mrs. Elton, but to Miss Woodhouse, as the latter plainly saw. The wish of distinguishing her, as far as civility permitted, was very evident, though it could not often proceed beyond a look. Mr. Elton made his appearance. His lady greeted him with some of her sparkling vivacity. "'Very pretty, sir, upon my word, to send me on here to be an encumbrance to my friends, so long before you vouchsafe to come. But you knew what a dutiful creature you had to deal with. You knew I should not stir till my lord and master appeared. Here have I been sitting this hour, giving these young ladies a sample of true conjugal obedience, for who can say, you know, how soon it may be wanted?' Mr. Elton was so hot and tired that all this wit seemed thrown away. His civilities to the other ladies must be paid, but his subsequent object was to lament over himself for the heat he was suffering, and the walk he had had for nothing. "'When I got to Donwell,' said he, "'Knightley could not be found. Very odd, very unaccountable, after the note I sent him this morning, and the message he returned, that he should certainly be at home till one. "'Donwell!' cried his wife. "'My dear Mr. E., you have not been to Donwell. You mean the Crown. You come from the meeting at the Crown.' "'No, no, that's to-morrow, and I particularly wanted to see Knightley to-day on that very account. Such a dreadful, broiling morning. I went over the fields, too,' speaking in a tone of great ill-usage, "'which made it so much the worse, and then not to find him at home.' I assure you I am not at all pleased, and no apology left, no message for me. The housekeeper declared she knew nothing of my being expected. Very extraordinary. And nobody knew at all which way he was gone. Perhaps to Hartfield, perhaps to the Abbey Mill, perhaps into his woods. Miss Woodhouse, this is not like our friend Knightley. Can you explain it? Emma amused herself by protesting that it was very extraordinary indeed, and that she had not a syllable to say for him. I cannot imagine— said Mrs. Elton, feeling the indignity as a wife ought to do. "'I cannot imagine how he could do such a thing by you, of all people in the world, the very last person whom one should expect to be forgotten. My dear Mr. E., he must have left a message for you, I am sure he must. Not even Knightley could be so very eccentric. And his servants forgot it. Depend upon it, that was the case, and very likely to happen with the Donwell servants, who are all, I have often observed, extremely awkward and remiss. I am sure I would not have such a creature as his Harry stand at our sideboard for any consideration. And as for Mrs. Hodges, Wright holds her very cheap indeed. She promised Wright a receipt, and never sent it. I met William Larkins, continued Mr. Elton as I got near the house, and he told me I should not find his master at home, but I did not believe him. William seemed rather out of humour. He did not know it was come to his master lately, he said, but he could hardly ever get the speech of him. I have nothing to do with William's wants, but it really is of a very great importance that I should see Knightley to-day, and it becomes a matter, therefore, of very serious inconvenience that I should have had this hot walk to no purpose." Emma felt that she could not do better than go home directly. In all probability she was at this very time waited for there, and Mr. Knightley might be preserved from sinking deeper in aggression towards Mr. Elton, if not towards William Larkins. She was pleased, on taking leave, to find Miss Fairfax determined to attend her out of the room, to go with her even downstairs. It gave her an opportunity which she immediately made use of, to say, "'It is as well, perhaps, that I have not had the possibility—' 
Had you not been surrounded by other friends, I might have been tempted to introduce a subject, to ask questions, to speak more openly than might have been strictly correct. I feel that I should certainly have been impertinent. Oh! cried Jane, with a blush and an hesitation which Emma thought infinitely more becoming to her than all the elegance of all her usual composure. There would have been no danger. The danger would have been of my wearying you. You could not have gratified me more than by expressing an interest. Indeed, Miss Woodhouse, speaking more collectedly, with the consciousness which I have had of my misconduct, very great misconduct, it is particularly consoling to me to know that those of my friends, whose good opinion is most worth preserving, are not disgusted to such a degree as to—I have not time for half that I could wish to say. I long to make apologies, excuses, to urge something for myself. I feel it so very due. But, unfortunately, in short, if your compassion does not stand my friend— "'Oh, you are too scrupulous, indeed you are!' cried Emma warmly, and taking her hand. "'You owe me no apologies, and everybody to whom you might be supposed to owe them is so perfectly satisfied, so delighted even. You are very kind, but I know what my manners were to you, so cold and artificial. I had always a part to act. It was a life of deceit. I know that I must have disgusted you. Oh, pray say no more. I feel that all the apologies should be on my side.' Let us forgive each other at once. We must do whatever is to be done quickest, and I think our feelings will lose no time there. I hope you have very pleasant accounts from Windsor. Very. And the next news, I suppose, will be that we are to lose you, just as I begin to know you. Oh, as to all that, of course nothing can be thought of yet. I am here till claimed by Colonel and Mrs. Campbell. Nothing can actually be settled yet, perhaps, replied Emma, smiling. But excuse me, it must be thought of. The smile was returned as Jane answered, You are very right, it has been thought of. And I will own to you, I am sure it will be safe, that so far as our living with Mr. Churchill at Enscombe, it is settled. There must be three months at least of deep mourning, but when they are over, I imagine there will be nothing more to wait for. Thank you, thank you, that is just what I wanted to be assured of. Oh, if you knew how much I love everything that is decided and open! Good-bye. Good-bye. End of chapter 16 So, right? Wasn't that sweet? Emma and Jane, like, actually... Not fake bonding, but actual bonding bonding. And all on Jane's part. She had to chase Emma down. She's the one who clearly was not thrilled having Mrs. Elton there. But... For, for so many reasons, but especially because once Emma shows up, she, she clearly wants some alone time with Emma. It's such a happy thing to be able to be open and honest with someone. And Jane Fairfax does not contain any of the difficulties that Harriet poses as a good friend. And so Emma's world just opened up a whole lot. I have to think that on some level, Jane Fairfax's world just did too. Because Emma's got a lot of spunk and vivacity and moxie, you know what I mean? And Jane is, I mean, this is the most animated we've ever seen Jane. And Emma even says it's the most animated she's ever seen Jane. So I, I think this is a, this could be a good friendship. And even if they don't get a whole lot of time to spend together before uh, somebody's getting married, I have a feeling they're going to keep in touch with each other, which is awesome. Going back to the beginning of the chapter, I love that Mrs. John Knightley was delighted to be of use. Semicolon. Anything of ill health was a recommendation to her. It's like, oh, Harriet is suffering from some unknown malady. Here, let me fix everything. I have all the things and all the doctors and all the knowledge. So, yay, I get to do my thing. Which is, could be crazy making, but also it's sweet and certainly learned behavior from dad. And again, there is there is a remarkable lack of anybody rolling their eyes about the fact that nobody knows Harriet's parentage. I don't know if that's stuck out to you as much as it has to me all the way through this book, but especially when you look at, at other books that come from later time periods where things like this would be far more scandalous, uh, it's kind of interesting that it's just ain't no thing here. It's kind of 
kind of nice, honestly. So I don't know if you could hear it. We'll put it up on the screen for, for YouTube. But if you if you glance at, you know, Gutenberg or anywhere, you will see that right before Mrs. Elton does the little rhyming couplet, she also has a lot of M dashes, not nearly as many as Miss Bates will have. But she's starting and stopping herself, too. But her starting and stopping, at least to me, feels far more calculated to be irksome to Emma. And another point of fact in that whole lovely behavior on Mrs. Elton's part is that all all Emma had to do was turn her head to the side to look at what Mrs. Bates was knitting. And Mrs. Elton starts kind of stage whispering or fluttering, folding up the letter that she's not supposed to show anybody else. And Emma can't possibly see it. That would be wrong. But then after she does her little rhyming couplet bit, she says, I mentioned no names, you will observe, and that's in italics. Oh, no. Cautious as a minister of state. I managed it extremely well. And I thought, now that's interesting, because that line could have come from Miss Bates easily. There's nothing in that line that has uh, no chance of ever coming out of Miss Bates's mouth. The difference is the intention. Miss Bates would be telling you this because she's telegraphing to you that she's she's doing the right thing by you. And here, Mrs. Elton is doing this to telegraph to Emma, you're not in the club. I found that fascinating that the the lines could be really interchangeable. But boy, even even without being able to quote unquote hear an actor or or read a stage direction or anything like that from from the author, it is so clear how different these two women are. And again, I just loved poor Miss Bates when she does come in. She doesn't know who has said what to whom. She doesn't know how much anyone can know. And that's a horrible position to be in, especially for her when you know she drops truth bombs all the time. And I thought Jane Austen did a lovely, lovely job of describing, could not help being diverted by the perplexity of her first answer to herself, resulting, she supposed, from doubt of what might be said and impatience to say everything. The, the thank you, Miss Dear Woodhouse, you are all kindness, M dash. It is impossible to say M dash. Yes, indeed, I quite understand M dash. Nobody's saying anything during this. She is just readjusting her thinking to know what it is that she can, she can or cannot say and uh, flubbing it every so often, but in a kind of adorable way instead of horrible Mrs. Elton. We got more of the Lord and Master thing, which just, I drew so many eye rolls, eye rolls and tongues out in my margins of this chapter. It's not even funny. Did you not adore the fact that Emma knew Mr. Knightley's schedule better than Mrs. Elton knew Mr. Elton's? I mean, that was a gimme from Jane Austen. That was just her saying, let's just gloat with Emma for a moment, shall we? Let's do her a solid. She gets to, she gets to, after after learning how to do better and be better and really being diligent about trying to do and be better, she gets a little payoff. And oh, Mrs. Elton. I also loved that we got to see Jane be a little feisty in this chapter. I mean, we knew it was there. We knew it had to be there, especially when she had her little tete-a-tete with Emma, like, you have to understand how important it is for me to not be around humans right now. And uh, certainly you could get this. But then I love that Mrs. Elton makes the we never heard of such things at Maple Grove. And Jane's response, your parish there was small. And I, upon my word, my dear, I do not know, for I never heard the subject talked of. And Jane's response, but it is proved by the smallness of the school, which I've heard you speak of, as under the patronage of your sister and Mrs. Bragg, the only school, and not more than five and twenty children. So she has both been paying attention, and she has been clocking everything Mrs. Elton has been saying, and finally has an opportunity to just go and turn it around on her. But then then I had a horrifying moment because Mrs. Elton says something that sounds like something I would say. Ah, oh, you clever creature, that's very true. What a thinking brain you have. And I'm like, oh, that's like Heather's human people. I mean, I have a reason in my head why I talk about human people as a identifiable subgroup of humanity or, you know, the people in general. But <clears throat> thinking brain is a little circular reasoning there and a little tautology 
that made me go, oh dear. Yeah, that's actually something I would say. What a lovely thinking brain you have. Of course, it's also like, what other kind of brain are you accusing Jane of having or not having? That's kind of tacky. I did love what a poop Elton was coming in, just like Frank coming in hot and tired. I get it. Heather understands the hot humidity misery. Totally. He's saying things in front of non-family members here, and especially as the clergyman of the parish. He is saying things in this chapter that are so inappropriate to be saying in front of other people. Some of this even crosses a line with his wife, potentially, depending on how structured their household was, and I'm guessing not much in that kind of respect, which is fine. But when Elton says Mr. Uh, William Larkins, who works at Donwell, seemed ra rather out of humor. He did not know what was coming to his master lately, he said, but he could hardly ever get the speech out of him. You know, he couldn't get it Don, <laughs> he couldn't get Mr. Knightley to stop and talk about things that were going on at Donwell at all, because we know where Mr. Knightley's thinking and heart is right now. And then Elton follows that up with, I have nothing to do with William's wants. But it really is of very great importance that I should see Knightley today. Oh, oh, right. Because you're the main character in the movie and everybody else is just an extra. Okay, Elton. Any sadness we may have felt for how uh, embarrassing the carriage ride was with him and, and Emma and how completely he, he blew it and she blew it and, and he, was, he felt misunderstood and wronged and led on. With reason, anything that might have made you feel empathy slash sympathy for him in that pain, I think can just go right out the window with this line. I have nothing to do with William's wants. Well, William Larkin is really respected and needed by Mr. Knightley. So if you respect Mr. Knightley, you should have some respect for Mr. William Larkin. Elton. Oh my God, these people. And then, like I said, the um, three three months of mourning for uh, Mrs. Churchill, now that she has passed, is completely appropriate. And after that, then Frank and Jane could publish the bands and go through the process and, and finally get married. And she's happy. I did love the little, there was a little dig somewhere. I think it was from Mrs. Mrs. Elton, the, a doctor from Windsor making Jane feel so much better. And that was supposed to be sly because Frank Churchill right now is in Windsor. And she called him a doctor, so Emma couldn't possibly pick up on that, except she will, and Elton wants her to, and, ugh. Ugh. But Jane, 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 Jane took some of her own gumption out and displayed it. She has also done a very good job of pushing back on Mrs. Elton as far as, uh, here, let me force you into a life of semi-servitude as a governess. Marvelously well. All's mended that needed to be mended between her and Frank. And Frank turned out to be not a cad last week. So it's a pretty, wrapping up to be a pretty happy ending without, I think, being uh, contrived or cloying. People, people earn their happy in this book. And that's, that's nice. It's nice to see that when people put in the work, that they get some payoff for it. All right. I hope you have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Don't forget, quilt raffle. I'll be sending that sucker out ASAP. And uh, and book party this month, Haunting of Hill House, Shirley Jackson. I've got the playlist in uh, for the online, the YouTube free version of the book, which is marvelously read, by the way. Tara really found a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous track. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, you can follow the instructions at uh, craftlit.com slash premium. And that will tell you how, if you're not actually a member, there is still a way that you could join the book party. And it's very simple. Hi, it's Heather from the future. And I am here because I just, this moment as I was recording the time codes, got a voicemail from Steph. And it's about Frankenstein, which is, you know, kind of timely because it's up on YouTube now and available. it's always been available everywhere that the audio is, but it's the first time we've had it up on YouTube. Anywho, I think she has an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. And so I'm going to play you her question and then I'm going to add a question to it. All right, here we go. Hi, Heather. This is Steph. Uh, I am calling about Frankenstein. 
so spoilers for a 200-year-old book about bringing the dead back to life. Uh, at the very end, the creature says he's going to paddle, build a bonfire, and jump in, right? My question is, how? With what wood? All of northern Canada is uh, tundra, and it's all permafrost. The trees can't get their roots in past the permafrost. Um, and I hate to be the, um, actually, Mrs. Shelley, but, like, uh, it's kind of too bad because, like, all of her, uh, when she describes, like, you know, Italy and stuff like that, it's so vivid and real. And I mean, I can't really fault her for not knowing what the Arctic Circle's like. So that's it. That was my thought. Okay, bye. Love this. Bye. Love you. Bye. So I think Steph is bringing up an interesting question. I have not gone back and listened to the end of the book. I'd been listening as I was posting stuff. I was listening to mostly the opening chapters. Here's my question. Is he, is this when he's already, has he left the ship and are they in the, the sledges that they are driving across the tundra? Because if so, is he talking about that wood? I don't know. But the the corollary to all of that is I think Steph is probably correct. I think this is probably one of those moments where Mary Shelley didn't know stuff. Actually, wait a minute. I'm starting to think. Okay. I'm thinking about the exploration of the the North Pole and all of the the permafrost and tundra lands up there as a Western Hemisphere thing. But uh the Sami that goes way north. Does that go up to the, does their land go up to the Arctic Circle? Or Norway? Okay, we really are going to have to have people call in because if, if there was easily accessed information about Arctic Circle permafrost agriculture that, that was easily accessible by somebody like Mary Shelley, who was very well educated, um, would that have timed out for this book, early 1800s? I don't know, but it's a fascinating question, and I'm sure that somebody who's listening knows. You can write heather at craftlit.com or call 206 350 1642 and uh, fill us all in if you know something, because it's a, it's a good question. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to linktree, l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.